Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jody Kilbasa. I'm the director of the Virginia Film Festival, which is presented by the University of Virginia. Thank you. And, and I also have the good fortune to serve as vice provost for the arts here at the university. Um, I would like to welcome you to this afternoon screening of our Nixon. Uh, this is an important screening to me. All these screenings are important to me, but in particular because last year we were fortunate enough to launch a new series that looks at and explores the role of the presidency in film in association with the Miller Center. We launched that series with all the president's men, marking the 40th anniversary of Watergate and a moderated discussion with Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, moderated by Governor Gerald Lyles, who founded the Virginia Film Festival over 25 years ago. Thanks for my job. <laughs> so we continue that series today with our Nixon, and I'm pleased to continue it, and one we hope to bring back every year. We feel it's a very, very significant part of the festival. A couple things I wanted to share with you. You actually still have time after this to see more films, so I encourage you to do so, <laughs> because every person who sees another film adds to the fourth straight year of record-setting attendance. So we will set a record once again this year. So thank you to everyone out there in the community, all the students, everybody in the community of Charlottesville, and everybody who travels in. Uh, secondly, I would like to thank and recognize uh, President Terry Sullivan for joining us here today. Thank you very much. <laughs> stay afterwards for a conversation with Governor Belisles, with the producer, um, uh, uh, Ken, uh, Ken Hughes from the Miller Center, and the producer of the film, Brian Fry, as well. Enjoy the film, everyone. Thank you. And uh, silence your cell phones. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jerry Belisles, director of the Miller Center here at the University of Virginia. I'm pleased to recognize President Sullivan and her husband, Doug Laycock, and also all of you for being here for this extraordinary showing of the documentary, Our Nixon. I'm pleased to also introduce two impressive guests for this post-film discussion. Uh, Brian Fry, next to me, is the producer of Our Nixon documentary. Briefly, Brian is a filmmaker, writer and professor of law at the University of Kentucky. His films explore relationships between history, society, and cinema and amateur images. And his films have been shown at film festivals and museums across the country. He was named one of Filmmaker Magazine's 25 New Faces of Independent Film in 2012. Next to him is Ken Hughes, who joined the Miller Center's Presidential Recordings Program in 2000 after more than a decade of covering the federal government as a journalist. His research on the White House tapes of Richard Nixon, Lyndon B. Johnson, and John F. Kennedy focused on the politics of the Vietnam War. He has published and spoken widely on the Nixon presidency and appeared on almost all of the television networks when the most recent batch of the Nixon White House tapes uh, was released. Our format for the next few minutes is one of some discussion about the film and its production process. Once we get a couple of these technical things out of the way, we will then turn to the contributions to the historical understanding of the Nixon presidency. And perhaps we'll have time for some differences and generational responses uh, to the film itself. We want to leave time for questions from the audience. So the first question goes to Brian. This film stitches together uh, some old Super 8 movies, some TV clips, and some recent White House tapes transcribed by the University's Miller Center. Tell us how you found out about the existence of these long-lost home movies how did you acquire them? And how was it that you found out about the Miller Center's work on the Nixon tapes? And while we're on that separate subject, tell us what you found most revealing about the White House tapes that the Miller Center has transcribed. 
<clears throat> so um, the just briefly, the films themselves um, uh, were confiscated by the United States government, by the FBI, from John Ehrlichman's office after he after he resigned um, after he resigned his position. Um, and uh, those were they were prints initially that uh, I believe Haldeman had made for John Ehrlichman, and so those went into the into the Nixon Library. Um, and in 2000, uh, Bill Brand, who's a, uh, a film professor and a film preservationist, uh, took on a project for the National Archives to preserve those films onto um, 60 millimeter internegative. And at the time, I was teaching with him at Hampshire College and getting a ride with him to and from from New York City, and so. He told me about the project he was working on, knowing that I was really interested in amateur film, and of course I was fascinated by it. He, he showed me uh, one reel to give me a taste of what he was doing, um, and I talked about it a lot. I actually wrote a short article about the films uh, based on primary sources for Cineast magazine. But um, at the time, the government had the funding to to create preservation copies of the films, but they didn't have cop they didn't have funding to create uh, viewing copies. So um, I, you know, I didn't have the, the money at the time, or the you know kind of the, and the technical situation wasn't such that I felt that I could get the I could get copies of the films that I could use. So I wanted to do something with them, but wasn't sure how to actually go about doing that. Um, and in two thousand eight, I met uh, Penny Lane and told her about the existence of these films. Penny Lane was your director? Yes, Penny Lane directed the film. Um, we worked on it together throughout the process. Um, and uh, she, uh, we agreed that we wanted to make the film together, but we didn't know anything about what was, or we knew very little about what, what the films actually looked like. You know, I had seen one reel and that was it. So um, we kind of, on a wing and a prayer, we paid for the uh, video transfers of the entire 25 hour collection, which cost about $20,000. And so sight unseen, we, we put the money down to cover that, got the tapes with our fingers crossed, and um, spent a couple of weeks at the Yado Artist Colony just watching the movies, asking ourselves what kind of story they were capable of telling. And it became clear to us very quickly that the story we saw in those home movies was that of the experience of Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Chapin working for the president. And the ultimate film kind of grew out of our effort to try to capture as best as we could um, some aspect or some kind of quality of, of their experience of working for the president um, and what it was like to be in the Nixon White House at the time. To try to understand um, their experiences and wrap our head wrap our heads around where they were coming from. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's where the film came from and it kind of grew and out of that. It started, started much more minimally. It was just, initially we started with just Super 8 films paired with secret White House recordings and then gradually we worked in additional elements as it became clear that we needed signposts to help people understand what was happening in the historical record. The thing about the tapes is that they're very, very specific and so without some context, it's difficult to understand what they're talking about. Um, by contrast, in some ways, the home movies are very uh, generic looking. So without some context, you don't know what's going on. Um, but that combination of specificity and genericness, I think, played for us very well, especially when we could give people kind of signposts um, in the form of the news broadcasts. Um, and uh, I think what was most revealing for me, uh, or for both of us really, um, about working with the, the tapes, and you know, we obviously used the Miller Center uh, resources really extensively, and it was an incredibly useful resource for us. Um, I think the most surprising thing for us was that everyone thinks that, you know, oh, I've heard the secret White House recordings, oh, I know all about those. But in reality, I think most people have heard the same two minutes of excerpts that everyone else has heard. Uh, you know, the smoking gun kind of moments, the same very small, limited things. You know, there's 4,000 hours of tapes and I'm talking about all number of, of different things. And, you know, unlike I think other people who previously um, have engaged with and studied the Nixon White House, we were, we were less interested in sort of 
exploring the abuse of power issues and more interested in other aspects of the Nixon presidency, right? Who these people were, what they cared about, what motivated them to make the decisions that they did, good or bad, as the case may be. Um, and so we were looking for tapes that had a different quality. And I think one of the fun things for us about the movie is that it presents a lot of material that other um, historians and certainly filmmakers have um, not chosen to use because I think our focus was, was different from that that a lot of other people have taken. Thank you. Let me pose another question before we turn to, uh, to Ken. This film has been described as not the typical information delivery documentary. So tell us, what was your goal in this movie? Tell us how the film evolved after you had the movies and tapes in hand, and how did you frame the narrative? Uh, did you decide, how did you decide what to include, and what to omit? After all, there were 500 tapes, or reels of tapes. So tell us about the process of the framing of the narrative. Sure, um, so initially we thought we would make the film without ever mentioning the word Watergate. Um, we kind of perversely wanted to make a Nixon movie where obviously Watergate would loom large in the mind of everyone who watched the film, but we wanted it to be kind of present in its absence. Um, but unfortunately, like many um, great kind of theories or great kind of, um, it didn't work very well, right? <laughs> Sadly, that was not to be. Um, and so we kind of went the opposite direction and felt like, well, we have to open the film then with Watergate in a kind of almost like a Sunset Boulevard type way, where you, know, you, open, with the, you open with the ending and then figure out, try to make, give some sense of how, of how you got there. Um, now, what, what did we choose to include? Well, you know, to be honest, um, the 50 hours uh, or 25 hours of material, a lot of it is kind of repetitive. Um, a lot of it's not that interesting. Haldeman was a very strange man. Um, I mean, I feel like he's almost borderline autistic or something. Um, and he would film exactly the same thing over and over and over again. And frequently it was like long, like long shots of Nixon standing on a podium giving a speech, right? Or you know, standing with a foreign dignitary. And there's silent super great films. There's nothing more boring um, than poorly shot images of people talking. Um, it's really kind of dull. So, you know, from the Super 8 material, what we ended up using was pretty much anything that reflected the kind of quality that we felt that the Super 8 film represented for us uh, in the context of the story. So anything that reflected sort of the day-to-day -day experiences of being in the White House. And we pulled pretty much everything of that kind that there was in the material. Um, one thing we, we really left out um, was that, you know, like anyone making a movie, they filmed a lot while they were traveling with the president, and there were a lot of trips, and a lot of them were not as significant as others. I mean, they're all, they're all the president traveling, they're all a big deal in one way or another, but, you know, an 85-minute film, you can only cover a very limited number of subjects, um, and so we kind of had to curate the Nixon presidency in some sense, and decide what moments were emblematic of the presidency as a whole. Right, so you know, obviously the trip to China was a big one, the Apollo moon landing, you know, the, the 68 protests, and we felt each one of those stood for sort of some aspect of Nixon's relationship to his staff and some aspect of Nixon's relationship to the country. And, you know, that was a judgment call on our part, but there was, there's a lot of great traveling footage, like trips to Romania, trips to Russia, trips to Iran during the, um, during the Shah era, that it's phenomenal stuff, right? It's really great, but it was just like, we can't, we can't have another, you know, Nixon goes X, Y, and Z place. It just was too much. You know, Europe was gonna have, Europe and China were gonna kind of have to book in the, the travels with the president. You know, you could make an entire feature length film out of these super great films. It's nothing but, you know, traveling with the president. Um, and, um, and if you want to, you can, because one of the things that Penny and I are doing when we kind of, the whirlwind starts to slow down a little bit and we have some time, is we're gonna be putting um, all 25 hours of material up on archive.org so that anyone who wants to see it can watch it and use it and make it available to, uh, to the public. It's in the public domain, it belongs to the American people and we think that they ought to have access to it, which currently isn't, isn't really the case. 
Um, there, there we actually did, we had to do the transfer twice because the initial um, transfer that we did was from the Super 8 second and third generation prints and the image quality was quite poor. Um, but at the time we thought that was all the material that existed or whatever exists. Uh, and so we just kind of had to you know, make our minds up to deal with the lack of image quality. And then as we were locking the, the cut of the film, we got a call from Ryan Pettigrew, who is the chief AV archivist at the Nixon Library and an absolute godsend to our project. Um, and Ryan told us that the Haldeman family had just donated Haldeman's original Super 8 films, and were we interested in possibly doing something? And we're like, oh god, you know. <laughs> there, there goes another $25,000. Um, but, uh, you know, because they were the original materials, um, and they hadn't been preserved in any way, the library um, was not in a position to allow them to leave the building. Um, so we actually really were fortunate that uh, a man named Jeff Krinas, who I've known for a long time, had invented a new uh, film scanning machine that's about the size of a suitcase and creates 4K scans, which is basically the resolution that you use for IMAX movies. Um, and so he took his scanner to the Nixon Library for a week and a half um, and spent that time uh, scanning the movies at the library for us. Um, and the result, I think, is probably the highest quality um, Super 8 images in any movie ever. Um, and I think it's really important, actually, and you know, Jeff's kind of argument with his machine at Canada is that the smaller gauge the film, the more important the high quality transfer is because the grain plays such an important role in the texture of how the film looks. And I think it's unfortunate that you know, small gauge film, super great film, has acquired a kind of visual rhetoric of being cruddy looking and not very pretty, when anyone who is actually familiar with small gauge film knows that it's absolutely gorgeous and very textured and produces a beautiful image. And so for, for me, as someone who's always been invested in, in, in film and in, um, especially in small gauge film, it was a real pleasure to be able to present a film that showed people just how beautiful it could look. Thanks. Ken, uh, this question is for you. Tell us, how does the Nixon we meet in this film uh, compare to the Nixon you've come to know by listening to hours and hours and hours and hours of White House tapes? It's much more terse. In this. It's, a, it's much more brief. I understand that one of your inspirations for this movie was a seven and a half hour German television show called Our Hitler. It's a feature like film. Yeah. You tell me, I, I sat through the entire thing when I was 15. And uh, it was a blast. <laughs> and I was wondering when I read that uh, this was inspired by that movie, um, you know, first off, whether you would have Nixon in a togo rising out of the grave of Richard Wagner <laughs> as they had in Art Hitler, or perhaps like a puppet Nixon, which they yeah. had in that too. Yeah. But yeah. instead, I was... Yeah, I think, I think it would have had to be like Perry Como or something. <laughs> instead, I was, I was really intrigued that you decided to take the angle of how did Haldeman and Ehrlichman and Dwight Chapin view Nixon and use the tapes to get that, that kind of perspective. And so I thought you, I thought you were really good at getting. <laughs> you're gesturing me to hold this closer to my mouth. I thought you were really good at um, getting those kind of off the beaten track Rosencrantz and Guildenstern kind of perspectives on Nixon. And uh, I was really pleased that you did that. And of course, since I have spent years and years, as <laughs> the governor reminded me, uh, listening to these tapes each in each scene, I was going. There was something else going on there, too. And there were these five or ten other things. So I'm mentally working on a sequel at seven and a half hours. Like, uh, <laughs> and I think we called it My Nixon. And it would just uh, it'd go into like, all, all sorts of nerdy depth and, and uh, all the stuff that you weren't able to bring in. Um, but, you know, the, the figure, the, the Nixon that we see here, um, you get glimpses of Nixon who's on the tapes, and I, I thought it was really great that you had John Ehrlichman point out that he discovered from listening to the tapes how much Nixon compartmentalized, because Nixon did. Um, all these people, Holdman, Ehrlichman, and Chapin, only saw little parts of Nixon, 
And you know, it reminds me of our Hitler when we meet Hitler's valet, and he talks about what Hitler had for breakfast every morning. It was chocolate. And why do I still remember that? <laughs> you know, so many years later. But it's you know, you 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 realize that this giant historic figure who affected everybody also played this really important large role in the personal lives of these guys who we don't really think of except as the supporting cast for the main guy. And um, I, I also thought, I, I like the way you described the way the, uh, the movie evolved because when it started I was like, okay, a light-hearted rock romp through the Nixon years, <laughs> I'm up for this. Uh, you know, naturally somebody like me would be up for this. And the idea that you're putting 25 hours of, of home movies on, online. It's Christmas for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but I, I thought that was actually also really telling because um, I remember dimly the Nixon years. I entered kindergarten the year that Nixon entered the White House. And so these, these visuals, uh, these television excerpts, you know, bring me flashbacks. And um, it was, I thought, really effective to see how Nixon, whom we learn about in retrospect as the Watergate guy, the only president to resign, was viewed as this incredibly competent, politically masterful, and I have to say extremely popular president, uh, despite all his personal quirks, when he began. And so when you know, the, the, the veil starts to come off and you, you just get you know, glimpses of Watergate, um, I thought that the way you handled that, the mood of that, was, was particularly effective. But I won't let me stop any afterwards. <laughs> is it fair to, to say, this question can go to both of you, is it fair to say, as some have said, that the film evokes emotional rather than intellectual responses, that it draws the viewer away from Watergate, that it paints the key players? Uh, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Chapin as people rather than villains. Uh, was that the purpose? Yeah, but very much so. I mean, you know, in the course of making the film, we felt we felt like we really developed a, a kind of sympathy for them as human beings, not you know as a way of um, absolving them of their criminal behavior, but we felt like we kind of understood who they were and felt and 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 empathized with them in some way. Um, and it was fun, actually, we, we did a test screening that uh, Carl Bernstein came to, and when the movie was over, um, he, we were terrified as to what his reaction was gonna be, um, and he, he loved it, he said, you know, it's the first time that anyone has humanized Haldeman, and we were very flattered by that. Only, our only reservation was that we thought he was wrong. The first time someone had humanized Haldeman was Carl Bernstein in his own book. Um, but you know, it was still a very nice thing for him to say. I, I wanted to say, I, I'm, I'm like H.R. Haldeman's only fan. Because you mentioned that he seems autistic, but listening to him in the Nixon White House with John Ehrlichman and Henry Kissinger, maybe compared, maybe on the spectrum of humanity, Haldeman is a little bit off. But in the White Oval Office, he's often the only guy saying, Oh, we don't really have to break into the Brookings Institution. <laughs> we could send someone over and ask for what we want. And, you know, or perhaps, Mr. President, since you're taking the New York Times and Daniel Ellsberg to court for leaking the Pentagon Papers, it's not a good idea for you to leak the ones you want yourself. This, this could create a problem for us. And, it, you know, it, 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 it's, it's comical because what he's saying is the sort of thing that would occur to anybody, but not the sort of thing that everybody in Nixon's inner circle feels comfortable saying. So I was, I was really glad that you, that you humanized them. And I wish we could do that more. The Nixon tapes, a lot of the personal stuff is, for excellent reasons, simply extracted before they release it to the public. Uh, that's, you know, because presidents are allowed to have a personal life and family matters are not stuff that, you know, necessarily we all need to know about. But we wind up mainly seeing the official Nixon. And, you know, when you get little glimpses of the private Nixon, I think it's, it's illuminating because while he's this special guy, it's like Shakespeare, you know, he's, he's this huge figure 
in, in world history, but he's also a guy. You know, he also, uh, you know, he gets nervous sometimes, he's heady sometimes, he's, he's gentle and generous sometimes, he's not very often, but he's, he's very sympathetic with other politicians. Like one time, I remember, he had to ease Robert Finch to the side, and Robert Finch was this huge political boon to him in 1968, but he was just a little bit too liberal, and so he has, he says, you know, as he's easing Bob Finch out, he's like, um, you can use my office over in the EOB. It's got a bar, you know, <laughs> and you know you can you can go sit there and you know have a drink and, and put your feet up on the president's desk and and, and he'll enjoy that. And it's like yeah, you know, it's it's that's kind of the thing that somebody who's being used out of his job might want to do put a, put his feet up on the boss's desk, and it's not something you ever really think of Nixon as doing. So Ken, uh, do you think this is an accurate portrayal of the people who were caught up uh, in Watergate? It's an accurate glimpse of how they saw it. I would, of course, you know, you know, based on years and years of research, say, wait, John Ehrlichman, you didn't totally tell Richard Nixon that you broke into Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office. You said something bad happened <laughs> over the weekend, and the less you know about it, the better. And when Ehrlichman was being prosecuted, yeah, he probably wanted to think that Nixon was just as guilty as him. But that was Ehrlichman reconstructing it in memory. But it's, it's good to see how things look to Ehrlichman and to Holland and to Jim. Yeah, no, it was really interesting for us how the, these three different characters really perceived their role and <coughs> kind of the, their subsequent responsibility and relationship to the president in very different ways. I mean, Ehrlichman, I think, was felt very much betrayed by the president. Haldeman really stuck by him to the bitter end. You know, his insistence, his, his inability to cope with metaphor, his insistence on an absolute completeness of facts. I mean, Haldeman initially was gonna make a TV version, um, uh, or TV film using the home movies himself. And it never happened, I think, largely just because his version would have been so dry that no one would have wanted to watch it because he just couldn't accept anything less than a full and complete exposition of the facts. Um, Which makes him my hero. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. And then, and then Chapin just is, was so confused and lost and couldn't believe how this could have happened. We should say anti-hero. Okay, okay, Brian. Were you, so were you surprised uh, by the reaction of the Nixon loyalist uh, to the documentary? And uh, did your own perceptions of Nixon change during the production process? Well, I, absolutely. I mean, neither one of us was particularly ideological, ideologically committed one way or another to Nixon. This was particularly ideological, ideologically committed one way or another to Nixon before we made the film. I mean, I was born shortly after Nixon resigned and Penny was born a few years later than me. Um, and so we came into the film, you know, knowing a well-educated person's normal amount about the president. We learned, well, Penny knew very little about Nixon actually before we started making the movie. And we both obviously learned a lot while making it, um, you know, we read a lot while we were working on the film as a way of thinking about what was happening. Um, one book that was especially useful for us was Rick Perlstein's book, Nixon Land, because we, we really saw Nixon's relationship to his staff as being a kind of metaphor for Nixon's relationship to the American people, um, and that in some way his betrayal of his staff was a sort of, some in some ways mirrored his betrayal of America, sort of letting down the trust of the American people. And reading Pearlstein's book, you know, that kind of, well, I guess it's actually a fictitious political quote, you know, I don't know how Nixon could have won, no one I know voted for him. Um, you know, it, it, I think it's very easy to, you know, if, if, if you were to, to ask people today, you know, did you vote for Nixon or McGovern? McGovern wins by a landslide. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting to ask, you know, what was it about Nixon or, you know, why did Nixon appeal so strongly to the American people, especially in 72, and I think Bernstein's book was very useful for us in kind of understanding that dynamic in America, which we hadn't lived through um, ourselves. Now, was I surprised by the Nixon um, loyalist reaction? No, I mean, when you call them up and say you're a documentary filmmaker, they hear a communist. Um, so, you know, <laughs> I really, we really didn't expect them to embrace the film. I think it's, I'm 
I think it's sad, and I hope that they realize at some point that this is about as generous a portrayal that a non-committed person is going to make of Nixon and his staff. Um, and I think that once they kind of their blood cools down a little bit, they may you know see the film for what it is, as opposed to you know seeing the blood in their eyes. And I, I hope that that reaction allows them to sort of to have a different uh, r relationship to the movie at some point. Brian, your comment about being born um, at the time Nixon was leaving office um, poses something of a generational question. Uh, some of us here in this room uh, may be of the age to have lived through the Nixon uh, years. Uh, we're familiar with his opening to China. We remember the wage and price uh, controls that he imposed. We remember the creation of EPA. Uh, the enemies list, his temperament, all of these things, including the Watergate uh, cover-up and the resignation. So for some of us, this film is a pretty thin slice of, uh, of a much larger story we already know. So what about those who came after Nixon and Watergate, such as yourself? What does this film tell them about Nixon? And is there a perception quite likely to be different from those who lived through the Nixon years? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think people who experience the Nixon presidency have a very different um, experience of watching the movie because they bring a lot of context and personal history to it. I mean, you know, if I had a dollar for every person who says, oh my God, I remember the, you know, the, the Watergate hearings vividly. You know, my family watched them every night. This is my first kind of my first introduction to politics, and it was so crazy. I mean, yeah, you know, whereas for people from my generation, often they know very little beyond, you know, I'm not a crook, Watergate, um, you know, Holloman or Olympian went to prison, if that, you know? Um, so I do think it's a very different sort of set of experiences. We wanted the movie to appeal to um, audiences, who, audience members who lived through the Nixon presidency, whether ideally whether they were Nixon supporters or Nixon opponents, um, we tried to you know put a little something in there for everybody, as it were. But we also wanted it to make sense and appeal to you know, younger audiences who didn't have a lot of extensive knowledge or you know a deep uh, a deep understanding of the Nixon presidency. And, and actually, one thing I found as a documentary filmmaker is that when you approach a subject that people think they know a lot about, in some cases it's very dangerous because they think they know a lot more than they do, and frequently a lot of what they think they know is absolute baloney. Um, and, you know, you, you have to sort of manage that element. You know, people, people remember things differently than they actually happened in real life. And part of the appeal of working in an archival manner like this is it forces you, as you well know, forces you to deal with the reality as opposed to the stories that people have decided to spin around something. Going back to the primary sources is really critical. I mean, I, I'm, I'm focused on that in my scholarship as well. So the, the filmmaking that we've done really reflects that aspect of the values that we bring to the table. And I guess part of it for me too is, you know, I think a lot of younger documentary filmmakers especially see documentary filmmaking as a form of narrative filmmaking, not as an educational tool. So um, for me, the idea that people you know, are, are getting knowledge poured into their head from a film is actually really dangerous in some ways. Because you know, as a filmmaker, you realize that in an 85-minute, 90-minute documentary, you can include about as much factual information as like a short-form New Yorker article, maybe, right? If you do a really good job. Right? You want to learn something substantive about Nixon? Like, read his book. Right? That's, books are for getting information. Movies are for something different. Right? They're for giving you an experience. They provide something other than just raw data. And so we didn't really feel obligated to kind of cram everything in there. We wanted people to have an experience and to feel something different that they might not have expected to feel about the characters in the film rather than walk out feeling like, oh, I'm an expert on the Nixon presidency now. Because actually I think that, that that can't be true. And you know, encouraging people to leave a documentary and thinking that they now know something meaningful about a subject is, I just think, really a mistake. Well, uh, what a wonderful way to sort of segue into questions from the audience. And as we do so, let me make an observation. I think it's interesting, if not ironic, that at this Virginia Film Festival this year, 
as well as elsewhere in the country. Uh, we are remembering the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination, while at the same time we are focusing on the 40th anniversary of the Watergate time period. Uh, two intriguing figures who were locked in political combat for the White House, uh, neither of whom lived to complete, uh, did not survive their presidencies. It's, uh, it's, it's an irony uh, and an interesting uh, coincidence at the same time, uh, what a difference a decade can make. Um, so, uh, let's see if there are questions from the audience. Um, please uh, raise your hand and we will have, do we have a microphone to, in the back? Uh, just a moment. Microphone. I can speak loudly if people can hear. Go ahead. I'm very uh, interested in your reference to the Kennedy assassination in relationship to uh, Watergate. And it seems to be one similarity is the vast amount of uh, primary source information that's accumulated on, in both situations, the Nixon uh, tapes, for example, 7,000 hours. There's, there's got to be a humongous amount of information and, and data. As you look back at those situations, we know the outcome. So you're viewing that mass of data tends to be in some ways guided by the uh, you know, your, view, your view of the outcome. My question would be, for those that have really studied the Nixon tapes, in excruciating detail. Could, can you put together an 85 minute movie of selections from those 7,000 hours that really portray uh, many of the positive characteristics and contributions that uh, he made, in spite of the fact that a lot of them were absolutely overwhelmed by uh, his ultimate demise? I could hear the question, could others? Okay, Ken, do you want to take that one? The positive stuff with Nixon is complex. Um, you could make more than an 85 minute movie um, with the positive stuff from Nixon just in public, you know, his public statements. And that I think would actually be the best source of positive information about Nixon. Um, what I have learned when I was first hired by the Miller Center in 2000, my first job was to just go through, starting from the first tape on February 16, 1971, and just listen straight through to Nixon every day. I did that. I listened to two months of tapes and took notes on them, which took six months of time. And uh, what became immediately clear was how political everything he did was. You know, when we talk about the positive stuff about Richard Nixon, um, the opening to China is one that people usually bring up. For Nixon, the opening to China was incredibly political. Uh, he viewed it as a way to defang his critics on the left. Um, and also to, you know, trump them because it was something that they couldn't do. So when you're listening to Nixon's private conversations, the things that stand out that are most interesting, that are most fascinating, is how differently he perceives events from the way he presents them. Another thing people always mention is Nixon founded the Environmental Protection Agency. Well, for Nixon, that was a way to avoid a worse, in his view, which would be a stronger, Environmental Protection Bureau that he thought you know, Congress would, would foist on him. So, you know, publicly Nixon is a champion of the environment and taking credit for it. In private, he's saying, I'm so sick of the damned environment, I could die. <laughs> and so, I actually have put together a much more primitive set of videos using just Nixon on, in Vietnam, which you can watch if you go to fatalpolitics.com. I'm plugging this up, sorry. But hey, if anyone's going to watch that, it's these people. <laughs> um, where you just where it's contrast what Nixon was saying in public about what he was doing in Vietnam and why, and his private political calculations. And that, to me, is the most illuminating stuff. Um, so to, to try and answer your question is, there's a lot of positive Nixon on tape, um, on tape, but 
when you put it together with the candid Nixon, it puts all the positive stuff in a very different light. <coughs> one, one really interesting thing um, that, that, that I reflect on after hearing what you just had to say um, is, and, is that because, precisely because the Nixon administration believed that all of the documentation they were creating was the personal property of the president, um, the Nixon presidency is actually, ironically, the most transparent presidency that the American people will ever have, because no president would ever produce these kinds of documents again in the future. And it enables a kind of work like someone like he was doing, which I think is so critical to understanding you know, the dynamics of a White House. And I have no reason to think that subsequent presidencies don't reflect at least some of those. They're obviously, each one is an individual, and they're all you know, quirky in their different ways. But I, I would be surprised if other presidents didn't have a similar kind of dynamic going on. And you can actually, I think we can understand, it can help us understand how politics works and how, how the White House works in a really interesting and important way. Is there another question? I was glad to hear that you used uh, Rick's book to shape your, your story in some ways. Um, I'm curious about uh, two other works, or at least one of them, um, and whether you consulted them or not, and that is the Haldeman Diaries, which are quite extensive and uh, go nicely with the 24 Hours of Home Movies, and then that of um, Arthur Burns, who wrote a uh, almost as detailed memoir a few years later. Yeah, um, we actually did use the Haldeman Diaries very extensively, um, and uh, you, there's actually s excerpts from them in the film in a few places, uh, and initially we had considered using other ones that were also quite telling. Um, there's a very interesting diary entry where Haldeman tells his version of that final phone call with the president, and initially we kind of contrasted the actual phone call with Haldeman's uh, retelling of the event, which were very different in subtle and interesting ways. I think um, Haldeman leaves out the fact that the president was drunk, for instance. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, the Haldeman diaries were incredibly useful, um, especially for identifying what was taking place for us, because Haldeman was so unbelievably detailed in the level of kind of granular stuff that he was recording every night. And it really helped us figure out what was taking place when, so we could use the Haldeman Diaries to sort of situate the home movies, which were not cataloged in any meaningful way. And, and as I say, you know, they were very opaque in some respects. And so understanding who we were seeing, what was taking place, and so on, the, the Haldeman Diaries were incredibly useful for that. Uh, we did not use Arthur Burns's book. I mean, you know, there's so much Nixon material out there that, you know, we had to pick and choose to some extent. You know, we, we read a lot of secondary sources and we drew on the primary sources that um, were generated by the people who were the closest to Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Chapin. And we really decided very early on that the story was only going to be Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Chapin. Um, and, you know, it was very tempting to include more Kissinger because he's so colorful and everything he says is so urbane and funny and weird and you know, he's such a schemer and whatnot. And he's in the, the home movies quite a bit because he was sort of within the circle that Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Chapin were participating in. But we felt that it just wasn't, it, it, it was distracting to the movie to do too much of it. So, you know, we had to cut out some of that. We have time for one final question, if it is brief. I've been advised we're running out of time. Going once, going, oh, yes ma'am. No quick question uh, about the actual Watergate break-in, and I guess it's to you. Um, is it clear from the tapes that that was discussed in the Oval Office that Nixon knew before right. about the Watergate? That's a, a great question that everybody does ask about uh, whether we know whether Nixon personally ordered the Watergate break-in, and the answer is hey, sort of. Let me explain. He, he, there's no indication that he ordered that specific break-in or that wiretap, uh, that bugging. Um, but in uh, over a year before the Watergate break-in, in 1971, he tells H.R. Haldeman that he wants the campaign to do wiretapping. He, you know, this is sort of broadly says, you know, I, I want that kind of intelligence collection. 
So the longer answer is Nixon is morally responsible for that stuff because that would not have happened if he had not, you know, directed his number one guy, Haldeman, to use wiretapping to collect political intelligence. But the specific break-in, there's no evidence on the tapes that Nixon knew about that moment before it took place. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes uh, the discussion after this rather remarkable and thought-provoking film. We're very grateful to Brian for being here and, and uh, bringing his perspective on the film and Ken for adding colorful commentary uh, based upon his experience at the Miller Center. Please join me in, welcome, in thanking our guests. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.